Coming up on Tech Thing, what exactly happened last week at DEF CON? Ryzen 3 CPUs and a whole bunch more all coming up on Tech Thing. Thank you, patrons. Without your support via patreon.com slash tech thing, we wouldn't be able to make the show for you each and every week. Join the crew that makes Tech Thing possible at patreon.com slash tech thing. Thanks. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patrick Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. But no spoilers for Game of Thrones. Uh-uh. You better not spoil this for me. Seriously. Uh -huh. I will fire you. <laughs> not that I could. <laughs> I will poke your sad shoulder. And I will squeal. If you can avoid it, don't dislocate your shoulder. Just want to lay that out there. Ouch. It hurts. Yeah. Um, my voice hurts too, so if it sounds a little squeaky and strange, it's because I lost my voice over the weekend from DEF CON. So, but it's it's back. It's coming back. I just sound weird. You're very husky. <laughs> yeah, I'm very husky. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, you know, setting up the show today, getting things sorted out, and I see this announcement freaks me out. Um, what? We have an end of life for Adobe Flash. Oh, finally. Hopefully you've already disabled Adobe Flash, uh, you know, on your on your Windows PC or any I other PC. I hope so. Um, but Adobe, Mozilla, Microsoft, Google, Apple, pretty much everybody else on the planet are going to take old Yeller, <clears throat> I mean Flash, out behind the barn in 2020. <laughs> Um, yes. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm okay with this, given that it's so vulnerable to all sorts of different kinds of hacks. And for those of you who are going, why not disable it today, right? Because in 2020, Adobe won't distribute it anymore. Browsers are going to block it, right. which I think is fantastic. Yeah. Or, or browsers will block plugins that try to enable Flash. Um, so I think it's just going to take that long for because there's so many things out there that still depend on Flash to run. There are tons. Um, the flip side of this, of course, is the delightful irony uh, of, of there's basically like a, a petition on GitHub for Adobe huh? to open source Flash for future generations. <laughs> Which sounds really silly, but as somebody who has hundreds of hypercard stacks stuffed away on, uh, you know, system 6.5 floppies, I can't read. Uh, <laughs> it makes perfect sense because there are so many things that have been created in so many formats that if you can't access them, you can't access them. That's which true. Sounds really ridiculous when I say it that way. <laughs> but remember. Your grandkids can't look at the photos you're carefully saving if they can't get them off the drive, they can't right. read them off a drive, or they can't play them uh, out of in some format that they can't read. Yeah. I think migrating stuff from one platform to a new platform every few years is just going to be a thing. I yeah, forever. I would think so. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, because like we think about like, oh, well, I'm storing it in the cloud. It'll right. always be accessible in the cloud. Well, how many cloud storage firms have gone out of business? So many. Or changed their business model so that you can no longer afford to keep mm -hmm. several terabytes of pictures of it. I'm just, I'm curious, you know, I'm also curious what people are doing. Do you regularly check to make sure, you know, your billions of family photos are still online? How do you store them? Because this also seems like a good three, two, one backup yes, experience. Yes, it does. I'm currently getting my, my negatives scanned by a company and it takes several months because mm -hmm. it's a lot of negatives, but I'll let you guys know how that goes. We'll see. What are they going to send them to you on? Um, a hard drive that I had sent them. Good. And then they are also going to uh, do an online gallery if I ask them to, mm -hmm. but I don't know what their security is like, so I just prefer the hard drive, not the online gallery. Nobody wants those pictures of your first birthday party cake face smash going on. Basically, out on the yeah. The Barbies and everything, <laughs> like nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants that out on the internet, <laughs> especially on Facebook. So, DEF CON. DEF CON, yeah. Nothing happened, right? Nothing at all. <laughs> Nothing newsworthy happened at all. I was at DEF CON for the entire week. I also volunteered at B Size Las Vegas, mm -hmm. um, which we, we like to commonly call Hacker Summer Camp. So, there were several different newsworthy things that happened during Hacker Summer Camp in Las Vegas when conventions such as B Size Las Vegas, DEF CON, and Black Hat all occur. So, I just wanted to list out some of my favorite things that happened from the convention. So, this year, was the very first year that DEF CON hosted a voting machine hacking village. It's basically this huge room Full that was voting dedicated to hackers breaking, working together to break into and find different vulnerabilities on all these different voting machines that are used across the United States. 
So I would just want to say before people out there start getting really angry, remember we have been in situations where there have been known exploitable flaws on yes. voting machines that the voting machine manufacturer could not be bothered to repair. Right, and I do have some more information on that yeah. as well. Um, there were 30 different kinds of voting machines in total, and uh, with taking just minutes to break pretty much every really? all of these. Yeah, on Friday. So as soon as the convention opened and these people started breaking into the machines, and you can read all about it over on the uh, DEF CON Voting Village Twitter account. They kept on tweeting out every single time somebody somebody hacked into one. And yes, that is Rick Astley on a voting machine. <laughs> uh, yeah, they were able to break into these in less than two hours. For, for example, there was Karsten Sherman who hacked into a win vote machine, taking remote control and accessing election data within minutes. Hmm. And that was on a win vote mach machine. So win vote uses Windows XP long after XP support ended by Microsoft, which is horrible. And that one that I showed you a picture of, that that was a win vote system that was used to download Windows Media Player and play Rick Astley, which basically rickrolled the entire convention. Because why not? You know, it's DEF CON. Of course those things are going to happen. As silly as that sounds, you could be <laughs> like, well, well, no one's going to connect a voting machine to the internet during an election. Well, maybe somebody has asked, somebody, if somebody nefarious gets, if a bad agent, right. like saying, exactly. if a bad agent gets a hold of the voting machine and plugs a USB drive into it or does whatever they yes. need to do to hack into the machine, at that point, can you trust any of those records? Exactly. And what does that do to the voting process? Yes. It screws it That's up. exactly it. So in the US, voting machines get these certifications through this place called the Election Assistance Commission. And certificates, unfortunately, cost states over $1 million, uh, which averages out to like $30 to $40 per voter, which mm -hmm. is very expensive, so a lot of states just don't do it. Most of the machines are compliant up to 2002. 2002. Several of them have not been certified since. So that means any kind of new vulnerabilities that came out since 2002, a lot of the machines that are still on the market and still used are currently hackable. Yeah. So machines were decommissioned, the ones in particular for DEF CON, and DEF CON purchased these to be used in the village. Some had open USB ports on the back, which could allow for a shameless plug, a USB rubber ducky attack or root access. Organizers basically just want to shed uh, light on the flaws. They want to hopefully shed light on the fact that these things are possible mm -hmm. uh, in hopes that by showing how easy it is for some hackers in Vegas <laughs> to do this with no state backing whatsoever, it could be easy, even easier for state-sponsored attackers to do the same thing even more maliciously. So it's very scary and the fact that they bring these to DEF CON is a good thing because they're showing you, yeah. yes, these things are possible, we need to make it better. Well, okay, so influencing elections through screwing around with voting machines, right. surely there was nothing that was more frightening with that. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of news about that in 2016, so I'm sure this is a major, major thing that a lot of people are paying attention to right now. Uh, the next thing was a major vulnerability in Broadcom chipsets, which are used in most Android and iOS devices. Uh, updates to both of those operating systems were being shipped throughout July, and yeah. depending on your carrier, might, you might have already received that, with Apple sending out an update to fix the problem the day before folks started arriving in Vegas for Black Hat. So hopefully everybody downloaded that before they arrived in Black Hat, because if you got to Black Hat where the wireless and all of the data is basically, you're pretty much owned as soon as you get there, you're going to be compromised. Hopefully everybody already downloaded that before they got to Vegas. So basically it's a flaw in these chipsets that allows for an attack called Broadpone to take over a phone and gain root access remotely via Wi-Fi. Now if your Wi-Fi is on, the attacker just has to be in range and remotely exploit the attack over the airways to own your phone. If your Wi-Fi is off, <laughs> but you have high accuracy location services on, which still uses wireless right. to get your location uh, uh, accurately, it can still affect your phone. That's where it gets, I see that eye twitch. You're like, yeah, oh. I know. I, part of me is like, <laughs> yeah, which is, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, scary. that's the nightmare, right? I, but I turned off. Wi-Fi and yeah. Bluetooth, how can I be accessible? Mm -hmm. um, because GPS, I'm also, I'm laughing because I was like, oh, did I do that update? And I just, I'm updating it right now. Oh, <laughs> um, but I was laughing. I also was in the woods, right. you know, where there was no cell phone signal for the last yeah, week. So I feel confident that I have not been pwned. Yeah, you're probably fine. <laughs> if I used wireless in Vegas, I was pro I would probably have gotten pwned, but I didn't use Wi-Fi mm -hmm. the entire time I was there. And I turned off location services down to like device only, which is a setting in Android. 
Now this affects specifically iPhone 5 and up, okay. Nexus 5 for Google and up, Samsung Note and Galaxy 3 and on, anything higher than that, Whoa. and a lot of other ones as well. So you have to check the Broadcom chipset that is your, in your phone to make sure to see if you are vulnerable. And if you were, make sure that you download those uh, updates from your carrier, from Google, or from Apple as well. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do to keep yourself safe is update your phone because they did fix that vulnerability. And if you don't have the update available from a carrier yet, just make sure to keep your Wi-Fi and your location services off or use them very, very minimally. What? Chances are you won't be targeted, but just in case. Now, lastly. I'm sorry, this is so awful. Like basically. I know, it's so awful. There's a whole bunch of those phones that are probably going to receive updates in the distant future, if yep. at all. Yeah. Um, that sucks. Yes, it's uh, it's scary. It's very, very scary. Now, the last thing I wanted to mention, a friend of mine, his name is Dark Matter, he was running around with 25 Wi-Fi pineapple tetras on his back, and he was calling this thing the hashtag Wi-Fi cactus. He or was basically, porcupine. he was collecting, yeah, I'll show you the picture. He was basically collecting wireless data on 50 different channels, hence the 50 different wireless uh, Wi-Fi pineapple tetras. So these are for the channels in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz without channel hopping. Whoa. So this allowed him to collect data on all of the channels without losing packets in between hops. So if you're just using one device and it's hopping between different uh, channels, right. you might lose some of the packet data while you're channel hopping. Not if you're scanning all 50 channels <laughs> yeah, all the time. Exactly. So <laughs> since he's scanning all 50 of them, he was able to gather it all into one Intel Nook, which is packaged at the very top right up here, uh, running a packet analysis and recon software, which is called Karma. So by doing so, he could educate the convention on the uh, different things that you could be susceptible to of having Wi-Fi turned on while at DEF CON, but also find out if Broadpone was being used in the wild during the event. Oh boy. So the entire thing ran off a car battery. It weighed about 40 pounds, and you can see the car battery down at the bottom. <laughs> nice. And yes, I definitely did try it on. And yes, there is video. I will hopefully have that for you in the edit. But it was really cool, and I think it's very a good educational mm -hmm. tool. But heck, I will never see a company ever carry around one of these because that thing is way too heavy. But it was cool. It was really cool. You never know. <laughs> With miniaturization. Uh, all, all in all, batteries. I gotta say, DEF CON was so fun this year. Like, it was very organized, mm -hmm. it was very stress-free. I got to talk to a lot of people on network and potentially, like, have some future advertisers or something. Who knows? But there was lots of lots, lots and lots of great people that I was able to talk to. So, if you were one of those, especially to our patrons, I ran into a few of the, you guys out there, too. Thank you, Thank you so much of course, for your support. Yeah. But it was awesome to meet so many of you over in Vegas, and it was excellent meeting all the women, too, that came up and said that um, my my podcast really helped them get into the InfoSec field. So that cool. warmed my heart. It was awesome seeing so many women at the convention. Really appreciate everybody that came up and said hi. We love you guys so much. We do. Big news last week, couple stories from AMD. The Ryzen 3 1300X and 1200 processor are here. 129 bucks, 109 bucks, four true cores. Joining us now, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Ryan Shrout from PC Per. Welcome back, Ryan. Hey, thanks for having me. So we've, we've kind of had this consistent story. AMD has the Ryzen 7, more cores, less money. The Ryzen 5 competing, of course, with the, the, the Core i5 series. And now at the, the entry level, the most price sensitive areas, the Ryzen 3 delivering four true cores. How are these working out? I mean, we're looking at like Core i5 7500 specs for seven or like 75 bucks less. I mean, it's crazy to look at that. Yeah, so the, the advantage that the Ryzen 3 has over the Core i3 is Core i3 is two core hyper threaded. Mm -hmm. So you still have access to four threads of compute. The Ryzen 3 is four threads, uh, but they're all individual cores. They're not sharing resources uh, like you see in kind of an SMT configuration. Sure. Um, now, so so any multi-threaded application or workload, Ryzen 3 is going to best the Core i3 pretty handily. Right. In single-threaded workloads, that's different. The, the Core i3 is still going to have the advantage. They run at higher clocks, uh, and just Intel has better single-threaded performance uh, across the board. And it does kind of come, it's interesting because the Core i7, or I'm sorry, the Ryzen 7 kind of competed against Intel's higher-end parts. The Core mm -hmm. i5, uh, the Ryzen 5 competed a little bit against the Core i7, and we're seeing the same thing with Ryzen 3 breaching into that Core i5 realm um, and where the Core i5s are quad-core, no hyper-threading. Um, 
So in those instances, you get pretty close. They kind of trade performance wins back and forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, but again, it's single threaded. It's going to it's going to fall behind a little bit. It's still pretty good value. The Ryzen 3 platform uh, where you get into gaming, where true quad core is going to perform better than dual core hyper threaded. Uh -huh. uh, and in general, the Ryzen 3 does does really well in the in those series of tests. So the Pentium G4560, that's a two core, four thread part. That's still pretty much the performance per dollar leader, especially on single threaded apps, right? Yeah, it is. So it's two core, four thread. It doesn't have turbo boost, but it's got a very high clock rate of 4.2 gigahertz. And the interesting thing about it is the MSRP of that part is actually $65. Mm -hmm. You can only find it for like 80 to 85 uh, as we looked at it for that review. So it could be even better performance per dollar if it were selling at its expected price. But because of you know people doing coin mining and stuff and trying to find the cheapest high performance processors to put in those types of builds, the prices have gone up a little bit. But it is, it is still a, a, an exceptional part uh, in that regard. If you're playing, you know, not particularly taxing games, if, 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 for example, myself, you're running around in Rocket League on a 1080p monitor, what would be your preferred part? Would you go for the less expensive Pentium part or would you go for the Core, I, or excuse me, the Ryzen 3? Um, I, I honestly think at this point I would probably go with the Ryzen 3. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it gives you a little bit more flexibility for those non-gaming workloads. It's going to be close in gaming, and then if you happen to do any video editing, photo editing, that's going to spike uh, performance for multi-threaded workload, uh, you get an advantage there. So, you looked at this currently uh, in the th like the 3.4 gigahertz stock speed. Have you done any overclocking with these parts yet? Just a tiny little bit. Um, e everything in the Ryzen family seems to kind of have the same peak clock speed based on mm -hmm. what I'm seeing, right? So. Um, you still have the same die in there. You're operating at less cores. So in theory, you should still be able to hit like a 3.8 to 4.0 range on these. But they, you are going to do that at the cost of adding voltage and adding heat and thermals um, to a device that ships with a integrated cooler that is probably not great for overclocking, but pretty, you know, it's very good for the out-of-box experience. So if you're going to spend more on cooling, you have that ability. Uh, but if you're going to use the in-box cooler, it's probably best just to leave it at, at stock. Something I was uh, highly amused by, of course, the first comments on the review is basically like, oh, AMD can't support high-speed RAM on yet another part. Performance is ruined. I mean, how much performance are we looking at from running a higher speed RAM versus, you know, the, a, a, a stock clock speed on the RAM? The interesting thing is the, the uh, memory tolerance or the, the, the impact by memory speed on Ryzen is higher than on the Intel processors. So you do get an advantage going from DDR2400 to 2800 to 3000 or 3200 speeds um, in, in multi-threaded workloads and in single-threaded workloads and in gaming. Like we pretty much see sure. it across the board. The problem is when you get down into these $100, $120 processors, the price delta between 2400 megahertz memory and 3200 megahertz memory is going to be close to the cost of the CPU itself. <laughs> so you get in, you're getting into a range where the, the the audience that's buying this, they're buying it because it's low cost, it's right. budget friendly, uh, but still has good performance. If you're going to spend a bunch more to get uh, higher speed memory, you may be better off buying that Ryzen 5 or Ryzen 7 uh, part as well. Spending the money on the CPU rather than spending the money on the memory that yeah. may or may not deliver. That makes sense. So under yeah. $100, it seems like uh, you know that Pentium part running at 4.2 gigahertz is kind of the performance leader. But is the Ryzen 3, are you thinking that's the best CPU for under 150 bucks for a budget build? I think so at this point. Um, you know, the unless Intel kind of adjusts price on their Kaby Lake Core i5 line, which I do not expect them to do, uh, maybe when Coffee Lake comes out, you know, late this year, they make some adjustments. But I do think the Ryzen 3, just like the Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 before it, make really, really compelling options by increasing performance at individual product or price price segments, I guess. So I, I do think Ryzen 3 is probably the best choice under 150. I feel like a $500 PC build is in my future. <laughs> 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 One other thing I want to pick your brains about, uh, AMD RX, or I should say the, the RX Vega, the consumer cards have been unveiled, $499 for an RX Vega 64, $399 for the RX Vega 56. Those are going to ship on August 14th. Is that pretty much when they're going to let people review them, or are you going to have to wait till after the cards ship to, to benchmark them? No, I, th I think the reviews will go live on August 14th as well. I don't think we have, um, we don't have, we don't have hardware in yet, so it's going to be mm -hmm. close regardless. 
Um, but yeah, no, I, I think reviews will go live the same day that things go on sale. I don't know if they'll do pre-orders before August 14th, um, but, but yeah, we'll have reviews on that day. So we're talking about like 210 watts for the, for the 56, 295 watts for the air-cooled Vega 64. Um, very, very similar specs in a lot of ways to the 1080 Ti. Do you expect these to have better gaming performance than the Vega Frontier Edition delivered? Um, actually, yes. So the the interesting thing is, uh, but to a to a moderate degree. So we mm -hmm. looked at the Frontier Edition, air cooled and water cooled, and they had very different thermal characteristics. Um, and what we see in RX Vega is that AMD kind of took some of that knowledge and is able to increase clock speeds a little bit. The way I look at it now, not having cards to actually test, just mm -hmm. looking at clock speeds and performance data. Uh, that AMD provided, the RX Vega air-cooled will be within 5-6% faster than the Frontier Edition cards were. They're going to get clocks a little bit higher um, at the same kind of, you know, almost 300 watt power draw. The water-cooled card is very interesting, although it is significantly more expensive. It's going to be $699 for you to get a hold of that one. Um, but because of its water-cooled, uh, you know, it, the temperature is going to be significantly lower on the GPU. They can keep the GPU at higher clocks more frequently. Uh, up to a point where I think the average clock is going to be 1,677 megahertz, which is you know almost 200 megahertz faster than the Frontier Edition air cooled that we tested. So we should see somewhere on the order of 10 to 13 percent performance mm -hmm. difference in those those kind of clock shader bound games that we test. Um, so it, it will be different. It will be a little bit faster. So it puts it closer in proximity to that GTX 1080 which is what, what they're targeting in terms of price, right? right? The expected MSRP of the 1080 is 499. Um, we actually saw some for sale yesterday for 509. So prices maybe are kind of coming back into a reasonable uh, uh, area. So that's that's what they're targeting. And then the 399 of the Vega 56 targets the GTX 1070. I, uh, I wait with bated breath to see the reviews on the 14th. Um, any thoughts about NVIDIA possibly dropping prices on the 1070, 1080, 1080 Ti in reaction? Or is all that going to happen well after the launch? I mean, I, I guess part of it's also we're looking at a lot of GPU prices that are inflated because Bitcoin mining's been kind of out of control. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't think you'll see NVIDIA really change prices or drop new products at all. Um, you know, that they don't know what the inventory is going to be like. We don't know if the, you know, the Vegas are just going to sell out in three days and then they don't have any more for a while. So it, it would behoove them to just kind of wait and be patient. And it's also the first time anybody's tried to release a new product in this kind of environment with the prices so volatile because of sure. the mining and cryptocurrency fields. So, you know, AMD's kind of trudging into uh, new waters with this as well. And it would, I think it would be intelligent of, of NVIDIA to just kind of sit and watch and see what happens for a little bit before jumping to any conclusions and, and making any shifts of their own. Makes sense to me. Ladies and gentlemen, check PCPer.com on the 14th for the review of the new Vega cards. And of course, the Ryzen 3 reviews are up there now. Ryan, thank you so much for making the time. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, we love your tweets and your emails. Keep sending them out to askatechthing.com. And hey, if you want to be part of the crew that makes Tech Thing possible, please contribute to the show at patreon.com slash techthing. Thank you so much for supporting the show, no matter how you do it. We got an email from Zebulon who writes, I got a new Dell XPS 15, and because I work in video production, I ended up choosing the model with the nice display. That's the 15.6 uh, 4K Ultra HD 3840 by 2160 display. He says there's just one problem. With some programs, such as the Wacom Preferences or the Crash Plan desktop app, the interface is too small to use effectively. He says I can manage to use them by changing the display resolution to 1080p, and because they aren't applications I need regular access to, it's not the end of the world. But I was hoping your experience with high resolution displays has taught you a handy fix for this issue, or even just a better workaround than what I came up with. Thanks for your help, Zebulon. That's a great question, because I've noticed that same issue with this Alienware that I've been messing around mm -hmm. with, and um, it's such a high-resolution display. Right. Sometimes I really can't see some of my uh, the things that I'm doing. So but I, I don't want to make the entire resolution 1080p. No. Uh, well, that not unless things go horribly awry. But let's yeah. see, so I'm going to right-click on my desktop here and go to Display Settings. And your primary tool for dealing with this is... Doo -doo 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 the uh, scaling tool, right, which allows right. you to change the size. And it's funny, it looks a little different depending on which version of Windows you have. Um, but, and because mine's set up attached to two monitors simultaneously, it looks even different than it normally does. But you notice like, you know, typical, you know, for a 1080p monitor, it's probably gonna be at 100%. Um, mm -hmm. For that 
8K monitor we had, it was at 300% because oh, at 100% yeah. it was like two-point text. Um, if you have difficulty with a, a high-res uh, monitor, I'd start with 125 or 150%. Um, and then things start to look like, well, apparently I would like to do, there we go, 150% is where I was running this one at. All right. Um, fortunately, right, most applications have what I'll call modern DPI handling, and mm -hmm. that when you scale it there, the, the application will scale appropriately on your monitor. Right. Um, but right now, let me scale it a little bit so you can actually see this uh, at home. I'll go up to like 200% on that one, there we go. Um, because this is actually scaled down because it's outputting to our capture machine. Right. Um, you know, one of the things you can do is uh, uh, go to the magnifier tool. And I don't really have anything that's not going to scale the way we want it to, but let's open up this text file. Pretend you can't read this text file. Okay. Um, and you don't need it all the time. You can go to the magnifier. And doo -doo -doo, you can go to the magnifier and you can temporarily Oh, cool. Uh, make something bigger. Okay. Um, it's not my favorite tool to use because I suck so bad at using it. <laughs> um, but it's literally zooming in super close to yeah, whatever it, is currently on your screen. Yeah, I don't... Uh, and there since it's temporary, you don't have to go into your display settings and change all exactly. that stuff. Exactly. I mean, the scaling gets kind of awkward. You can see, you know, lots yeah. of jaggies and stuff, but, you know, I can actually read this. There, on that 8K monitor, there were a couple of things that worked just fine at 200%. Um, that were completely illegible right. on the that 8K uh, monitor because it's so high resolution. Yeah. The problem really comes in is when you have an application you need all the time and it's generally old, hasn't been updated, and will not scale. Mm. Um, you can experiment with uh, you know there's some regex out there and manifest like WinArrow. Uh, has one a nice article how to fix apps that look small and high DPA and high resolution oh, cool. displays. There's a bunch of articles online that basically involve either tweaking uh, uh, the the regedit entry or like what they call an application manifest for a particular application. Okay. Um, if you have oddly enough something that does not scale well, um, well scales but doesn't scale properly, one of the things mm -hmm. you can do is find the executable file for the application. And I'm going to right click on that and go to properties. And this is for like Perfmon. Uh, click on compatibility. And you can go down and disable display scaling on high DPI settings. Oh, cool. um, so if you have something that scales, but it looks really squirrely or, or has massive jaggy issues, yeah. you can actually turn off the display uh, scaling on that. Um, all of that said, it turns out. Application scaling, especially for an individual application that mm -hmm. doesn't want to scale properly, is kind of stupid complicated. Um, Paul Thoreau, Paul Thorot, the amazing Windows person you can see here on the right of your screen, um, has a great article he did uh, about a year ago. Microsoft may never fix the high DPI issues in Windows 10, Aww. which is a great read about one of the problems uh, his wife had uh, moving from docking and undocking a high resolution laptop screen. Um, but it links to this amazing article on the Windows blog, uh, High DPI Scaling Improvements for Desktop Applications and Mixed Mode DPI Scaling in the Windows 10 Anniversary <laughs> Update, uh, and which basically walks you through the nightmare of getting like Notepad to scale. <laughs> Why is this such an issue? <laughs> like, I am going to tell you to go to the show notes, go to the article on throw.com. I feel like it's such a logical com. thing to fix. Come on, Microsoft. They keep tweaking it. <laughs> they keep, they keep tweaking, tweaking it. But it, it, it looks to be, you know, it's one of those things that looks simple. Yeah. And then actually making it work in the real universe. That's when it gets janky. <laughs> yes, that's a much more family friendly thing than the phrase I was trying to replace oh, inside funny. of my head. Um, uh, let us know if that fixed your problems yeah. and if anybody else has any uh, pro tips for him as well, we'll definitely share those on yeah. future episodes. So you can email those, ask at techthing.com or you can tweet at techthing. We got an email from Bill who writes, I know that Patrick loves geeking out on the developing technologies in new light bulbs. I do. Do you have any current recommendations for good low cost light bulbs? The one that they recommend on thewirecutter.com are priced higher than I was hoping for. Thanks from Bill. Oh my goodness. I have good news and I have bad news. Uh oh. Um, so I have Cree light bulbs, similar to the ones that the, the Sweet Home, Sweet Home is affiliated with Wirecutter, um, but their pick for the best LED light bulb is pretty much my pick for the best LED ah, light bulb. Okay. Cree 60 watt equivalent soft white A19 dimmable LEDs. Cool. Um, 
Yeah, I have like those or similar Cree light bulbs pretty much everywhere in my house at this time. There's one compact fluorescent left that I've just been too lazy to change <laughs> in, a, in a receptacle I, I almost never use. Yeah. These are pretty good because they're fairly low power. Mm -hmm. If you actually use uh, light uh, bulb dim or dimmer switches, they have a really huge uh, a gradient from lowest to highest brightness. Okay. Uh, and their color rendering index, their CRI, is about 85. So color, ender, color rendering index tells you how accurate colors underneath the lamp look. Oh, okay. It's What's the highest you can get? 100. Oh, okay, so, so like 80, 85 is pretty good. 85 is pretty good. Okay. Uh, 85 is better than average. 80 is probably typical, 80 or less is probably typical for a lot of um, uh, uh, LED bulbs. Okay. Um, anything above 80 CRI is great for most folks. Uh, there's some arguments like what works out is the color and an accurate look to the naked eye bulb may not be accurate for your video camera right. or professional cinematography, professional yeah. cinematography cameras. Yeah. Boy, it's hot in here today. Um, <laughs> But for a normal human being in most situations, anything above 80 is a good start. Okay. Um, for what it's worth, those Cree bulbs are actually a lot cheaper than uh, some of the other LED brands. And unlike cheap no brand LED bulbs, they last and they last and they last. And having tried out a whole bunch of cheap LED bulbs, I can say some of them are better than others and almost <laughs> all of them are way better than compact fluorescent lamps. Of so course. the link off the wire cutter, and I always suggest you support the wire cutter or, or Sweet Home if you if you use the recommendations because this is how they make money. Um, it's a four pack for nineteen ninety seven. Okay. However, so and, and again remember that's four for nineteen ninety seven, not nineteen ninety seven per individual bulb. Cool. If you go over to Amazon.com, the same basic bulb is ten dollars and sixteen cents. Oh, for wait, a four it says pack. four pack. Yes. Oh, that's a great price. That's half the price it is available at Home Depot. I'm gonna uh well. I'm gonna tweet the editor from the Sweet Home on that article and say, hey, could you add this link to your article because yeah, totally. it's available for considerably less money. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not quite half the cost, but it's really, really close to it. Um, really good line from that Sweet Home article because a lot of people, you know, it's kind of like saying like, I'm going to spend $40,000 on a new car because I'm going yeah. to save money on gas. And yeah, it's like, right. well, gas is the least expensive part of owning a car. I was just car. talking about that on my Twitter this morning. Yeah. Do you, <laughs> do you drive over 30, 40, 50,000 miles a year? No you're probably not gonna save money moving to a new yep. car. Um, you may do lots of other awesome things, uh, but, but, but it's not a great way to save money. In any case, the Sweet Home article says, if you're still using incandescent bulbs, note that LED bulbs have the potential to save you about $20 per year per bulb. A 60 really? watt equivalent LED bulb uses between eight and 11 watts, or roughly 13% of the energy of a 60 watt incandescent bulb. What? Yeah. Wow. So it is a considerable energy uh, reduction. And depending on how you look at it, you know, if you have 20 bulbs in your house and they average running eight hours a day and that's yeah. $20 a year per bulb, that could add up. That's a lot of money. It is. Or maybe you're looking at that being like a 20. That's like, you know, two drinks That's a, a lot of Frappuccinos. <laughs> It's like four that's how I do my math. I'm like, that's quite a few frappuccinos I could get. You know, a friend of mine used to calculate everything in six packs. <laughs> that's great. How many six packs is this thing? <laughs> how many Yinglings me? could I buy? <laughs> that's well, awesome. You can't. You have to import Yinglings. Well, you yeah, want to make Shannon true. really happy? Illegally send her a case of Yinglings. No, it's don't illegal. do that. Don't send you. A you're case not of supposed yinglings? to send alcohol. You can if you're traveling to San Francisco. You can put it in your checked baggage. Should you be traveling to San Francisco in the immediate future from there to the country where they distribute Yingling? I'm just saying. Yeah, just you know. saying. If you want a studio tour, I know how you can get it if you're from the Northeast. Bring back a Yingling, there we go. The fact that like that's the, uh, like a hipster beer now I know. horrifies me. Yeah, me too. I mean, that's right up there with like, you know, old stag, so stag. Funny. Stag, there's a Missouri beer. Oh, that's hilarious. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, once in a while, put down the phone, step away from the screen, close the laptop screen, and do something analog like Ricky, who writes. He wrote us saying, I don't know if this counts as hashtag analog, but this weekend I went to Kauai for my B-Day, left the laptops at home in Honolulu, and flew my Mavic all weekend. Nice. Also went chasing spots that only had E or lower for signal strength on my phone and video for what it's worth. And we'll put a link down to this video, and that's from Ricky Lee 99 in Honolulu. Happy birthday, Ricky. Yes, this is amazing. And now I want to go back to Kauai. And I hope I'm saying that right who doesn't want to go back to hawaii oh my man or it, Kauai it's beautiful or hawaii is gorgeous i went to the big island and hoping to spend some time down in oahu sooner or later since my sister just moved there so i'm very very excited about that yeah gosh look at that water isn't it gorgeous more naked surfing man that's some wait what 
It's a thing. You gotta learn how to surf first. Okay. It's like, well, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's, it's... Oh, and there's Ricky. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Ricky, for sharing that. That's awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you next week on Tech Fake. I hey. need to go get my shoulder looked at now. You do. Don't touch it. I'm not gonna touch it. I was just gonna like, I'm air touching it. I'm giving you an air hug. <laughs> an air hug is you nice. You thing. Yeah. <laughs> dislocated okay. shoulders are unpleasant. Both of our us aren't at 100% with my voice and your dislocated arm. Yeah, but I think you're closer to 100%. I was, yeah, I was totally. typing like. I know, it's so funny. I'm sorry to laugh. It is funny. It, it's, you look like a little T-Rex. Yeah, I feel like a little T-Rex. <laughs> My arms are too short. <laughs> oh, that's so great. I love it. That's the Robinsons. I love that movie. Oh, man, so funny. Thank you, all of you. Yes, thank you so much, patrons. We really appreciate your support. And thanks again to everybody who said hello that are patroning the show. This one and Threatwire. It was awesome to meet you in person. Y'all are so cool. Y'all are cool peoples. Thank cool you. peeps. Everybody's cool. Thanks for watching the show. <laughs> what cool. she said. Yeah.